All right, so it's a pleasure to be here to talk about this topic and also to have the opportunity to share with you the beginning of a process that will go on for the next three years, the Learning Analytics Task Force. I was looking around for some kind of a picture to stick on the front of a talk. You know, you can waste a lot of time that you should be spending on something else, <laughs> looking around for the right picture. And I found this picture of light shining in on the dyad in the 1930s. And that's, you know, light where we want to shine some light on what's going on here on campus. So that's how this picture ended up at the beginning of this talk. What I hope to do today is to give you some idea of what this Learning Analytics Task Force is going to be about to give you a first look at, at what we will be doing. I hope that you will take that message out and make sure that other people you know hear about it. We'll be trying to advertise it in a wide variety of ways as well. So I've been teaching here at the University of Michigan since 1995. And while I have had occasional classes on what you would call the human scale, most of the time I've been teaching really large courses. And I've kind of sought this out, I admit, because I think the chance to share the way I think about physics with a lot of people is something that I want to have. Right? So I've actually wanted to be able to do this. And I also have this feeling that the education of really large numbers of students is kind of the mission of a great public university like Michigan. You know, we're charged with doing that somehow. So I've been working on it uh, since I first got here, really. And for many years, I've felt really pretty successful. You know, I sat back and could bask in teaching evaluations for my students in which they said they enjoyed the class, in which they said they were learning a lot. But you know, from the start, there was this kind of nagging feeling in my mind that, in fact, most of the students in the class were not really developing the skills that I hoped that they were. In a class of 500, it's a really serious challenge to try and get an accurate picture, picture of what an entire group is doing. And so most of us tend to rely on anecdotes, right? The one student who comes all the time to your office, and you see that student do this magnificent thing. They start knowing nothing, and they get so far, and so you feel really good about your class. And you miss the fact that 499 <laughs> students did not have that experience, right? <laughs> so I, I was really subject to that. I had that exact experience myself. So since that time, I've become convinced that it's possible to have a much better handle on what's going on. About five years ago, I began working with some colleagues in physics, several of them are here in the room, I can <coughs> see, on trying to form a more accurate portrait of what actually happens in our classes. And I believe that we really can do that. We can learn much more about what's going on. And I'm teaching one of these classes right now, and I can feel for the first time how much it has changed the way I think about teaching. What it has done is force me to be aware of the individuality and diversity of all the students that are in the room. Now, I want to be clear about this. It doesn't mean that I can handle that. I can't actually know every student in the room. I can't actually interact with them. That problem does not go away just because you have good data. But at least it's really clear to me that we have this problem. And it has helped me to alter a little bit my general approach to these classes. All right. It doesn't make it a lot easier to act on the knowledge, but at least I'm working with some kind of heightened awareness. Okay, so let's talk about the mysteries of teaching and learning that are going on in our classes. When I look out in a classroom, there are a lot of questions I might ask, like, who are these people? <laughs> and, and what do they know when they come to my class? Why are they here? What do they learn and what do they remember from my class? And how does that affect the way they will lead the rest of their lives? What, maybe even just in the next class, maybe in what they'll major in. How much do the outcomes differ for different students? All these kind of classes. And then there are questions of sort of process. There's dynamics going on here. We're doing certain things in our teaching, certain results happen in their learning. Do we understand that? How well do we know the effect that our teaching methods have? And not only in the aggregate, you know, sort of how do they affect the average in the class, but who do they affect? And in what ways do they affect different kinds of students? And how much do they affect them? Is it possible for us to predict the outcomes for students and understand what it is that drives those outcomes? If we knew that, perhaps we could mess with the dynamics and change the outcomes. There's a sense that a lot of people have that teaching and learning is all so subtle that you couldn't make any measurements like this. Only the sort of inspired genius of an individual teacher is able to fully comprehend what's going on. And I would say that in a lot of different fields, there's a sense that expertise is the only way to know 
Um, medicine is a good example. Only an expert doctor could really comprehend everything. And yet what research shows is that expert doctors don't actually know as much as data does. I mean, they do it in certain ways. There are certain places where expertise cannot be beat, but there are a lot of places where it, it really doesn't help. So data is going to play an important role in, a, in understanding what's going on. What's making learning analytics really come alive at the moment is the fact that education systems are now generating extremely rich and increasingly accessible quantities of data that can be used to inform teaching and learning. As we'll talk about today, institutional systems like those here at the University of Michigan have actually been gathering and have amassed an enormous amount of this data now. So not only are we able to begin to take data on our students in a class today, we can look back over a substantial period and learn a lot about what has been going on in our class. The kinds of data that are involved in this, a lot of it is classical institutional data that you would expect the registrar of the university to maintain. A student's admissions record, um, information about placement tests that they might have taken when they arrived. But then there's other pieces. There are pieces that come from internal to classes. Things like individual assignments and exams and their grades. As these things are done more and more electronically, more can be known about these than just what answers they gave. You can know when they did them. You can know when they started them. I mean, there's all this kind of behavioral information that's kind of wrapped up in these systems as well. The use of learning management systems has caused data to explode as well, because it means that much of what happens in a class happens in an online framework that naturally gathers this stuff. I want to point out that most of us think about our class and how a student goes from the beginning to the end, but these institutional systems also retain the records of what they do later. So if we really want to go do research and understand something about how did a student's performance in my class affect their future, we can do that now. If the data exists to do it, it's not impossible. So the existence of a lot of data has really created a big movement around learning analytics. And it is a big movement. You know, I'm hypersensitive to this right now because I've been working on it, but probably everyone has noticed that this kind of analytics, learning analytics, uh, academic analytics, student tailoring, all this stuff is everywhere in the media. Um, it's going through an explosive hype period, I think, in which, um, for instance, Outsiders to the education world have decided, oh, that's the answer. We just have to do that, right? You know, there's a lot of funny things going on with it right now because it's in this high level of hype. But, you know, something like personalizing and tailoring, you see this in lots of these, lots of these titles. This is one of the ones that I think just is a good idea. If we can do things that are more aware of students' individual positions, how can it be a really bad thing? You know, how could you argue the opposite? No, we should definitely not personalize. There is a, an international movement around this. There's an interesting organization called the Society for Learning Analytics Research, which has emerged really in the last three years. They have run two international conferences now. And this particular group of people, which is, I would say, very international, there are more people in it certainly from other countries than there are in the United States, um, is aiming to draw a contrast between what they care about and a kind of other thing that they're calling academic analytics. And this other thing is more business oriented. So they, they want to make sure it's clear that their concern is with learners and teachers and not with administrators who are trying to squeeze another dime out of the system. Because there's a, there's a kind of sense that, that analytics is really about business analytics. So this group is trying to push back against that. And they um, define learning analytics as the measurement and collection analysis and reporting of data about learners and their context. So that's really the focus of the thing. And the purpose is to understand and optimize learning. Right? So they're really trying to stay focused on the learner. And I think most of us who are involved in this task force, that's what we want too. We're not here to try and um, optimize space use on campus. I mean, I think that's important to do. Somebody else should be doing that. But it's not why we're here. We're here really to focus on the learner. I would point out that the, one of those leading figures in solar, uh, George Siemens, will be giving this talk next week. So he'll be here on campus. He's a fascinating guy, has done a lot of interesting things. Among other things, he was a real pioneer in massive open online courses. And the way he does it is extremely different from the Coursera way, so you might like to hear about that. 
Learning analytics really should be about supporting a bunch of users. I mean, the reason for doing analytics is to take data and uh, summarize information from it and then make it available in some way so that it can be used. So I think the first goal is to help learners, to use learning analytics to help learners. And some of that will be, I think, very direct. We'll talk about that a little bit. It should help us as educators as well so that we can assess what it is we do and how well we do it. So we want to make sure that, that we are able to learn from it. It is important for people who guide the institution, for the leadership, the administration of the institution, to be able to answer questions too. And I'll just give you some examples. Like, the college has a bunch of college requirements, and they're met in certain ways. And the pattern of the way students meet those requirements changes with time, particularly when, when you have economic catastrophes occur in your country. Right? People get very nervous, and they stop taking certain things, and they start taking other things. And if we don't have sort of live access to what's really going on with that, then we can't optimally run the institution. <laughs> And finally, learning analytics is really powerful for researchers. I would say the first group up there, you know, most of the people who are learners or educators or administrators will not do this kind of research, but they will benefit from the results. So having uh, a world in which data like this is really available for researchers to, to get the best parts out and then share that and make it available for people uh, is really important. I think one of the things that excites me the most about all of this is the ability to use data to create an adaptive and kind of personalized experience. This picture here comes from a solar white paper about thinking about learning analytics in the future. And it shows on the outside some white colored boxes that are just a sketch of representing different kinds of data or interfaces that might uh, exist around the learning analytics world. The learning management system here would be C tools for us, different kinds of social computing, physical world data people start to talk about. You know, some people are talking about using the fact that they know when students enter and exit buildings. Um, understanding who the learner is, stuff like that. And then inside there are different pieces that actually do the work. So an analytics engine that would be doing the analysis, calculating things, um, extracting information from the rich data that flows into it. Once you have information, that information may be actionable, information that you want to do something about. And that's why you think about something like an intervention engine. That intervention engine could be a person. It could be that you send a message to a person and that person intervenes. That's one of the ways that we would do it. But it could also be a piece of technology that's able to decide this particular student needs this particular response. And then they've separated out on the side learning adaptation and personalization. And I think what they're thinking about in this part of it is really kind of cognitive tutors that watch very closely how a student is learning a particular subject and adapt to give them the, the kind of problems that they need and so on in real time. And we'll have some presentations about that later in the term too. All right, so let's bring this a little bit back to Michigan. We've got a big picture. I want to talk about where we are at Michigan and, and say a little bit about some projects that have been going on here and so on. At Michigan, we're actually in a pretty good place as far as data goes, compared to many of our peer institutions. And that's because in the mid-1990s, university moved to a data warehouse system that is the institutional repository for all of our official records. What this means is that all the official records for students since that time are available in more or less the same form in a digital manner. Right? That is a huge pile of information. I just sort of calculated out. That's the academic information, like the whole career of 100,000 students sitting there, uh, available for us to look at. There's also new kinds of information. That's all, this is all sort of registrar kind of information, the things you would expect the institution to have. But there are new kinds of information being gathered. We have extensive usage information about C-Tools basically back to its launch. Right. So it, it begin, begins to become possible to ask questions about how learning management systems are used and so on. The other thing, so we have a good data setup here at Michigan. We're in a good place as far as data goes. But the other thing that I think makes us a great place to do learning analytics is that this is one of the great social science research institutions in the world, right? We have experts on everything here. So if we can't analyze our own data and understand what's going on here, who's going to do it? You know, some community college? I don't think so, right? So we should be in the front of this, and I want to see that happen as much as possible. For people who maybe aren't even interested in how we teach our classes, there's great research projects in here that people will want to see the results of. So I want to go back to what, I, what is the beginning of this for me. And I know some of you have heard me 
uh, talk about this before because it really was formative for my thinking about this. It helped me to learn about what data was available. A project called the Academic Reporting Toolkit, um, an early web access to the data warehouse. What this system does is it was created by the Allison AIT committee in 2002, and it actually is just an interface to that data warehouse. It, it pulls data right out of the warehouse and shows it to you. What I think makes art so powerful and such a model for the future, not in detail, but in principle, is that it's a live tool, right? It's, it's not a report. It's not a paper that summarizes what we found in the data. It's a tool that lets you find things in the data. And that's what I think is, is so great about it. It has a very, very simple interface, just some pull down menus. And uh, unfortunately, even though this was started in 2002, it's really just now beginning to be extended in any way. So to a certain extent, we have a lost decade here. A decade, it's a long time. But, but it is starting to move, and I'm, I'm happy to say that. What does it do? Well, it has like little pull down menus like this, for those of you who are not familiar. You choose a starting term and a course, so physics 140 there, and you say, I want to see the average grades by term. And you push a button, and you get the average grades by term. And it's actually pulling that really out of the, you know, it's not like it summarized it already. It goes off to the real authentic data source and pulls this out and shows you what it is. Gives you a little table of what it was. It lets you do a few things to disaggregate it, like here you can look at whether the students were in LSNA or engineering or one of the other schools in college. Some simple things like that. It can also talk to you about things like course connections. Art right now is very course focused. It's about courses and, and how they act and how they behave. So here we're asking for students who are in Physics 140 in winter 2010, what other courses were they in? Again, you push the button and you find out what courses they're in. So this is something you can do for your students in your class right now. If you want to know what other courses they're taking right now, go find out. It's, it's available in the system. So here you can see that most of the people, most of the 707 students in this class, 668 of them, were taking physics 141. That's the lab for the class, so there's no big surprise in that. <laughs> you might want to know that they're not all taking it. Right? Something you could learn. So art is a really great thing. It's ease of use and the wide variety of questions that it allows you to ask are a real strength. But right now, not everyone on campus has access to the art system. So it's available for a limited set of instructors and administrators. And students have no visibility in this. Right? There are a lot of questions students might like to ask about classes. And right now, we give them no way to ask those questions. Now, I'm not sure exactly what we want them to be able to ask and answer. But right now, they, they have no visibility in this. Art, as it was constructed, is focused entirely on classes and their outcomes. So it's a historical tool when it's thinking about outcomes. It has no view into an existing class that's live. And that kind of thing is going to begin to be available. Um, one of the best things about art that I really like is that it was kind of a community effort. It was driven by people's excitement, not by um, a new president of the university coming in and saying, we need an analytics program, right? It was driven by us. It was driven by faculty members at Michigan who wanted to make something happen. It wasn't ordered from the outside. So it's there to answer our questions, not the questions of legislators in Lansing or anything else, just the questions teachers and learners wanted to answer. So it provides a powerful model, and we'll, we'll return to this idea as we go along. How did art happen? Well, Gus Everard, who chaired this thing, is here in the room. I don't know if we have any others right now with us, but you can see the list of people. Um, if you've been around here a while, you probably know all these names. Pretty familiar group of people. And what did they say? They said the system would provide annual summary reports of base statistics to chairs and directors. That didn't happen. It could, it just doesn't. Uh, it would offer faculty real-time access and descriptive analysis of student enrollments and performance. So that it does too. And it lets you search for patterns in course selection by students. And it was intended to do a kind of network analysis of the clustering of courses that students take together. And that, that never was fully realized either. But anyway, fantastic thing, built by this, what I would call an insurgent group of faculty and so on. And it happened because the data warehouse was kind of new, right? Now the data warehouse works. Well, we've got to do something with it, right? That's what they thought. And uh, they were able to do it at that time, I guess. You know, Gus, you'll have to tell me the whole story sometime. Because uh, the administrators weren't paying too much attention yet. Well, it, it, it's odd. Phil Hanlon actually wrote, when he was the chair of the committee before me, 
uh, wrote a proposal to the then LSA ITD uh, partnership program because there existed such a thing back then, and and he wanted to look at it basically item three, uh, course sequences and course pairings, mm -hmm. uh, and that's when when but then he you know he started his you know climb up the ladder and, and, and went away. <laughs> that day. So the insurgents took over, uh, and we realized that the, the higher order features in the data couldn't be understood until you understood the low order features in the data, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like enrollment patterns and, and uh, basic behaviors. So that's the genesis of art. It emerged into, this, this report was written, the interim report that you see there, there was never a final report, not one that <coughs> made it to the public at least. Right. And I think, you know, it was just, 2002 was just too early for this in a way. People were really nervous about data and privacy and they were in a, living in a different world. We now live in a world where people's understanding and awareness of these issues has just changed. And so I think the time is right for really uh, revisiting these things. I give great credit to the people who kept this alive, like Rob Wilkie kept this thing working the whole time, you know, like after hours. And, um, and people let him do that, right? So there was a good vision of keeping it alive, but it really looks the same. I mean, he did correct one misspelling that I told him about. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing that's really changed on this website. There have been a few additions, like uh, engineering asked to have the engineering courses added to art, and that was done. And now, when new faculty members come to the teaching academy in the fall, they are told about art, given access to it, and allowed to use it to learn things like, gosh, wh what kind of students are coming into my class when they're here to teach for the first time? So that's a good thing, too. Um, but real extension doesn't happen very much. In the meantime, there's been a lot of growth in learning analytics interest, and also a very exciting uh, array of new data sources. Very exciting and very problematic, because they're all really complicated. But in principle, things like lecture tools that Perry here has created produce an incredible stream of rich information. So new data is a really important part of this. Nevertheless, even the systematic data of the university, uh, use of it is really open to view. So we started something last fall. A bunch of people, Stephanie Teasley and I and Steve Lon, you know, who knew this stuff was going on, decided let's do something about it. And so we asked uh, Rackham for some money to run a seminar series, and we started this Student learning, well now it's actually relabeled, I see that. It used to be the Symposium on Learning Analytics at Michigan, but now Student Learning and Analytics at Michigan. And the website from last year's talks are, is, is up there. You can see that all the, all the speakers are here, all the talks are here, you can see a video of the talks, you can see the slides, everything. I'm going to tell you about a few of these projects as we go along here, just to give a sense of some of the stuff that's going on with Learning Analytics already at Michigan. So the principal goal of SLAM last year was to expose the activity that was happening on campus and to start to bring together a community of interested people, and I think it worked pretty well in that regard. So here's an example of a project done by Becky Max and Mark Banasek Hall in the chemistry department to look at whether concurrent enrollment in the laboratory actually enhanced student performance in chemistry. So a very specific kind of question within the class. You want to know, should we force our students to be concurrently enrolled? If you can show how important that is, you might want to do that, right? But by going in and looking at data warehouse data, they were able to show that the students, particularly the students who were least well prepared, were helped the most by this. So this is a good example of a case where picking things apart allows you to see not only did the whole tide rise, rise. If you look over here, you'll see that the average increase in final grade was about 0.1 in grade point uh, terms. But the students who were least well prepared, the ones in this first column here on the left, actually gained more. It was more important to them. Okay. So that's a nice example of a study like this. I would call this an analytics research study. It gives you information. It doesn't tell you what to do with it yet, but it does give you information. Then you have to go do something. Else. Another analytics research thing like this was done by Ann Gear in the Sweetland Center for Writing. They have been doing directed self-placement for first year writing students as they come into the university for a number of years now. So they have a, an enormous pile of essays written by students at the moment when they enter the university. Those used to be you know, impossible to do anything with. Now they're sitting on your desk and you can do anything you want. Right? So what they did is they, they did a bunch of different linguistic analysis on it. Here's just one kind of example. Searching so students do directed self-placement. They decide whether to go into a regular first-year writing class or into the Sweetland Center for Writing courses, which are for students who are worried about their writing skills. Kind of, They've self-selected into something where they want more writing help. 
And if you analyze what they write for these things called code glosses, and you see the phrases down here on the bottom, like specifically, that is to say, which means, right? These are features of writing that you expect to see a little more in academic writing. And the students who self-place into first year writing classes use those kinds of phrases more than twice as much. So this is a sign that there's something going on where the self-selection is, is, is reflecting real differences in writing. Anyway, it's a, it, it lets them start to understand what's happening in the process of self-selection. Another example of this, predicting achievement or student achievement in a first year introductory programming course. This comes from the College of Engineering and it, it involves taking the placement test that is used to decide which first year programming course students should take and looking at, at how well it works and in particular figuring out which questions on the placement test are really predictive and then focusing on those questions instead of the ones that don't tell you anything, right? So they were able to go in and show that they could adjust to the test and after they changed the test using this process, the correlation between the pretest score and the overall course grade actually increased. So they were able to show this is a better placement test. It's telling us better how well students would do in this class. Another research topic. And this one they actually are acting, right? Because they're changing the, uh, the placement test. There are also projects going on that don't just do research in the data, try to find out the answer to some question, but we're really trying to act on it right now. And an example of that kind of acting on the results of learning analytics is the work that the Use Lab has done with the MSTEM Academy. Um, I won't tell you all the details of this, but what they're really doing is pulling information from C tools and trying to use it to understand um, for the group of students who are in the MSTEM Academy, whether they're doing well in the classes right now, whether they seem to be at risk, or whether they're in big trouble, right? And they can provide for the advising mentors who work with the MSTEM students, they can provide um, a table that shows them how the students are doing right now. So they have a chance to act on that then. Here the, the, the intervention would be human. A person's gonna look at this and recognize it and, figure out how they should go talk to that individual student. So very often, the analytics can feed with a human in the loop. Now, there are times when you can't do this. MSTEM costs a lot of money because it costs a lot of money to have individuals matched up to every student. We teach introductory physics to about 1,900 students a term, and we do not have the resources to have individuals able to speak to every one of those students. So in physics, we've done a different thing, a different kind of intervention engine. It's an electronic computer tailored communication system that learns about every student and then uses a system called the Michigan Tailoring System, a, a tool I'll tell you more about in a second, to say to those students what we would say if we could. If I could sit with that student, I would say this. So if I know that, I could code it into the system and it will say it to many, many students. It also allows students the opportunity to learn from, the, from one another. A really nice feature of this is that you can take students have them experience the class, decide what made them successful in the class, and feed that advice back to the students. So the students can learn from one another about how to do this. That has two effects. First of all, they get pretty authentic advice about how they should be successful in the class, but it's also really good for the students presenting the advice because they have to think about what made them successful in the class. And that's a very powerful way for them to become a better student. Anyway, so we provide advice that is fed back so here, for example, right now in the fall 2012 term, we're feeding back advice that comes from winter 2012 students. They told the fall 2012 students how to prepare for an exam, right? This is an expert electronic coach, and its goal is to provide personalized feedback and encouragement and advice to individual students in this, in this class. And it's built on this Michigan tailoring system. This is a great example of how Michigan can make things happen that other places can't. The Center for Health Communications Research spent 20 years developing computer-tailored communication software. They did it for public health. Now we have adopted it for education. So that's an, another example. Those are five or six examples of projects that came out during the process of SLAM last year. In the meantime, there have been some extensions to ARC done. A, a little project that was done jointly between the Honors Program and the Comprehensive Studies Program has built a tool that provides a focus on students and their passage through the campus instead of a focus on classes the way art was. So the idea here is to be able to watch students go through the campus, 
see what, what they do while they're here, how they do, how they graduate, and so on. What it allows you to do is to pull out a group of students at the time that they enter the campus. You can actually pull them out at other times. I'll mention that too. But imagine I wanted to study the honors program. I would pull out students when they enter the campus in the honors program. And then I would like to have some kind of comparison group. People who came in at the same time, but didn't come into the honors program. Because I'm going to try and figure out whether the honors program has any impact. So the tool allows you to pull out of the rest of LSNA a comparison group. And you can define that in a couple of ways. For example, you can match the comparison group to the group of interest. Uh, with identical ACT scores. That's one way you might do it. I mean, there's lots of ways you could do it. You could argue forever about how you should do it. But anyway, it has, it has a couple of tools to allow you to do that. And then it pulls out data that allow you to see how did those students progress through the campus? How many credits did they take every term? Which majors did they concentrate in? What GPA did they end up with? How, what, what are these groups like as they go through the campus? And gives you the chance to see whether the program, honors program in this case, has an impact on them. This tool exists. It's not in a very fancy format yet, but I can show you a little bit about sort of how it works. Here's the matching step. So I told this particular poll to match students on, um, let's see if there are on this. I don't know if there's some. To match students on their composite ACT scores. And so at the upper left there, you can see two distributions of composite ACT scores that are identical, because I told them to be. Right. Um, the other three distributions show you the math scores, math ACT scores, and English ACT scores for the two groups. Not identical, because they weren't forced to be identical. Right. And then down here, you can see the matched and unmatched scores. So it turns out there are some honor students, this little group of yellow ones down here, but there are just too many with really high scores to find anybody else in LSNA that matches them. So we leave them out of the comparison for this purpose. That's what we do. So everything you see after this is a, a group that is perfectly matched on incoming composite ACT score, whatever that means. And then you can look at outcomes, like here is the GPA after the first term and at the end at graduation. The dashed lines are after first term, the solid lines are at graduation, and you're looking at blue lines for honor <coughs> students and red lines for LSNA students matched to them in ACT score. So. Um, this particular plot is very useful to me in honors because we have students and their parents who come in and they say, I don't know if my kid should be in honors because it's gonna hurt their GPA, yeah. Yeah. right? So now I can pull out the plot and say, no, it's not. In fact, they're gonna do a little bit better. That's really, that was worth the project right there. Because you know, we didn't know this. Who knew this, right? You don't know until you look. And that's my point, they convincing the people who want honors to change the <laughs> oh, isn't that interesting? That's why you need live tools that let you keep up with the data, right? You know, things change. Yeah, it's great. So we can look at concentrations. This is a, a kind of a nice chart. The, let me explain what, what's going on here. The size of each box that you see here represents the number of students who graduated with that, that kind of concentration. And we're looking at the three divisions of the college, social sciences, natural sciences, humanities. And then we've added the Ross School of Business there because some of the students who come in as freshmen go off the Ross. Right? We want to know how many there are. All right. The color that you see in each of these things reflects the balance. Remember, we took an equal number of incoming honor students and incoming LSNA students. It re represents the balance of whether there are more honor students in this group or more LSNA students in the group. So if it becomes completely red, it's all LSNA students that weren't in honors as freshmen. If it becomes completely blue, it's all students who were who were um, incoming students in honors. So in this chart, if you click on social sciences, it will expand out the social sciences. So well, let's click on natural sciences first, since that's the way I set it up. And it shows you all the concentrations in the natural sciences with the same color balance, right? So you can see that, first of all, in the natural sciences, people who enter in the honors program are more likely to concentrate in the natural sciences than students who don't. Right? But there are some, some little disciplines, like computer science, where that's, it, it, it's not so clear, right? There are small disciplines, quite a few of them, that are very largely uh, people who enter in the freshman honors program, physics being one of them. You see interdisciplinary physics there, too. Um, we'll see that pattern in other places, too. So social sciences. In the social sciences, there's a lot of people who come in, not in the honors program, but go to econ. Okay. Anyway, you could explore this all day. It's pretty fascinating. In the humanities. You can see there are a number of small humanities disciplines that are very largely 
students who come in through the honors program and so on. Anyway, it's not the point to, to talk about the particular results here, but to show you the kind of tool that you might want to use. Now we designed, or we, we were thinking about testing the impact of the honors program and CSP on students, but at the same time, you might instead pull out your group of students as the people who graduate in your concentration and say, what did they look like at the beginning? Or maybe people who took this class and you want to know where were they coming from and where did they go to, right? You can use all of those selection features and explore these kind of things with them. So we have an, an, an initial version. Okay, all that is leading up to today. So today what I want to do is I want to tell you about the Learning Analytics Task Force, uh, something that came out of the Provost Academic Affairs Advisory Committee. We spent about a year on that committee thinking about analytics, gathering some information about it, trying to decide what we might be able to do about it. And what we learned in that process is that there were really good opportunities to act, and we felt really pent up desire on campus to do something about this. We knew people who wanted to answer questions and couldn't answer them. So fortunately, the same Phil Hanlon that got that process started in 2001 <laughs> has risen to be the provost, and he found this easy to understand. So he created a learning analytics task force in January of last year as a kind of a small part of the university's third century initiative. For those of you who don't remember, Mary Sue Coleman announced the third century initiative last year and pledged to spend $50 million on research and learning and teaching as part of that. The committee was assembled and organized in April and started working in May. It has a charge with three major features to it. The first is to explore the University of Michigan environment for information and optimize it for learning analytics. So the idea here is to think about things like the data warehouse and the access to it and what systems we use to provide people with the authority to access data. Everything about the environment around the information. What tools do we make available? Do we have a service that can help people do this kind of analysis like CSCAR? You know, what, what should we put in place to make it easy for everyone to answer questions about teaching and learning that they have? So we're starting a process of thinking about that. We will be making recommendations eventually to the provost about what he might do about it. The second part of this is that we are supposed to learn from the university community by funding a series of projects around campus. So we're really looking for people who have an idea that we've never thought of, right. anything about measuring teaching and learning. And we're going to support projects about that. I'll talk about that in a second. And the third part of the charge is to recognize that the university does something like learning analytics already. There are things we measure on campus that are intended to reflect success in teaching and learning, like our student evaluation system, or the key performance indicators that deans and department heads use to argue about whether they're teaching well. Many of these indicators are, are not ones that you would want to defend at an education conference, for example. You know, they're what we use. They're not necessarily very good. And so we have an opportunity here to review those, to talk about them, and see whether, whether we want to make changes and what those changes might be. It's going to operate for three years, and you know, in this coming year, we'll really be writing reports on the first and third thing and running a proposal cycle. And then that stuff will continue. We're really going to try to disseminate this stuff, perhaps by running a couple of national conferences on the topic. We would really like to be involved in the national conversation as well as doing this on our campus. Here's a list of all the members of the committee. There's a bunch of them here in the room. I won't make them stand up since you probably know most of them anyway. We tried to get representation from a wide variety of areas, from the School of Engineering, from LSNA, from the Edu Education School, um, Public Health. We have people who are education research experts. We have people who pretty much don't know anything about education research, but are dedicated to the teaching in their particular area. So if you know any of these people, feel free to talk about them, edit, talk about them. <laughs> I'm sure you already feel free to do that. <laughs> feel free to talk to them about this at any time. What's been going on? So we had a number of meetings through the summer to put in place a kind of framework of support for this program. CRLT, as Connie mentioned, has agreed to support the SLAM seminars this year and in coming years probably as well. And we'll be supporting the Learning Analytics Fellows Program, and I'll tell you about it in a second. ITS is also prepared to provide support for this. So one of the nice things is that when the call for proposals comes out, it will include the fact that there are going to be some data experts ready to help you with your project. It's not just that we're going to give you some money and say, go figure out how to do it. Right? We're really looking to have more conversations of this kind. I think we really need to understand during this year what is, what are the questions people really want to ask and what barriers stand in the way. So we'll be thinking about different ways to do that. 
All right, let's talk about task force support for learning analytics project. There will be a call for proposals, which I believe will come out around October 1st. The deadline for the first set of, of um, proposals will be around November 15th. There'll be two, th two big components in this. The first will be something called Exploring Learning Analytics Grants. Um, and the second will be a Learning Analytics Fellows Program. The whole purpose of both is to build up this community around learning analytics. So let me talk first about Exploring Learning Analytics Project. The idea here is if you have a project that would use data, that wants to analyze data generated around academic activities at Michigan, we're prepared to provide support for that, both technical and financial. We're looking at projects that would range in scale from maybe 30K to 150K. They could be bigger. We don't really know what they need to be. So we, we're open to hearing from people about what they feel they really need to do their project. And we don't want to try and put this in too tight a box. One of the nice features of this is that because this is an internally funded and created program, you know, we don't have to have the same kind of set of rules that NSF has to have for a call for proposal. We're trying to work with people here. So I want people to start thinking about the projects that they would like to do. We imagine that there are some people, at least, who are ready to do pretty substantive projects. And that's what the Exploring Learning Analytics grants uh, are intended to support. We also imagine, however, that there are a number of people who are not ready to do that yet. We're really interested in this, thinking about what they might do, but don't know really what they want to do yet. So we're going to create a Learning Analytics Fellows Program during the winter 2013 semester modeled on the Sweetland Writing Fellows Program. At least that's how I was thinking about it when we started this. The idea is that this group of people would come together, senior fellows who are faculty, junior fellows who are, who are graduate students, staff members, I don't know who, who they all will be. And they would come together weekly for a couple of hours. Half of the meetings would be these talks. Right? So they would come to these talks, and interact with the speakers. The other half of the meetings would explore some of the central topics of learning analytics understanding more about the data that's available and what its, what its properties are, learning about things like quasi-experimental design, thinking about privacy, stuff like that. And everyone who participates will receive some stipend support. So we're trying to bring together a group, really uh, have them work together on learning about learning analytics. A good way of thinking about this is that if you think you might want to write a proposal, this would be a great way to get yourself ready to write a great proposal. So if you aren't ready to write it, but you think you want to, uh, participating in this should be very useful. There are new directions that we would like to support. I think it would be very exciting to have some of these projects explore new kinds of data, especially when this kind of data is likely to show up in many, many places. So for instance, there's kind of explosive growth in the use of a tool um, called Piazza, which is a question answering tool that, that is commercially available, but you can get your students into it for free. Really interesting social networking stuff going on in there. Students are posting, they're answering their questions, all that kind of stuff. It would be really fun to see somebody go and explore that. We're interested in things that could lead to new kinds of tools. So it's great to do a project that will answer a particular question in a particular class. But if you can realize that that question is actually very similar to the question many people would ask in their class, then you might do your project so that it develops a tool that other people could use, or it aims toward developing such a tool. Analytics is first about learning things about what's going on. Once you learn something about what's going on, you want to act on it. And so like the MSTEM program that I told you about, or eCoach, action based on the information generated by analytics is important. And then the, the, the frontier we have hardly crossed so far is providing tools that reach straight to students. So tools that help students have recommendations for what courses they might take next. You know, I want to see somebody give students the opportunity to explore data. They're incredibly creative. We give them a tool, who knows what they'll do with it? It'll probably be great, right? So I think we should think about how to, how to do that. There are lots of risks around learning analytics and concerns. Um, I think the, the, the fears that were around a lot a decade ago are still really live. In Chicago right now, there's a, there's a strike going on because people believe it's a bad idea to connect a single test score to a teacher's um, salary, right? So that kind of reductionist fear the no child left behind specter is out there. But I don't think that's such a big problem for us. I mean, we're researchers, we're good at this. We don't have to stop and say, oh, well, we'll just use one number. Why would we do that? You know, that would be wrong. So it shouldn't be such a concern for us. Um, I watch this happen, and as a physicist, I think about measurements, and I think about noise all the time when I think about measurements. And I don't hear that in the discussion about this that much. 
So there's sometimes when people are measuring noise and thinking it's real and that's kind of scary. A lot of people worry about student privacy. Students don't very much. <laughs> um, I'm afraid. <laughs> but everybody, I think, worries about freedom. And there's a kind of a fear in this that once people know who you are and everything, it kind of constrains your future. Like all this great prediction and stuff is scary to people because of that. Um, that's a real fear, and you know we're, we're navigating a new space when we think about this. Um, there are a couple of things that I have very little sympathy with, the concern that we'll find things we don't like. How can a researcher be worried about that? Um, or the fear that data will expose us to criticism. I mean, you know, the truth is the truth, and uh, we should find out what it is. There are also lots of really great opportunities, you know, for all these different users of learning analytics. Instructors may finally find out what's going on with their students and be able to act on that. Learners may be able to benefit from the experience of prior students. Wouldn't it be great if you came into a class and you could find out the students who got A's in this class last year? a distribution of how much time they spent on the class. Then at least you know sort of where you're starting from. Right? It's something uh, normative information that might help you change your behavior to what it needs to be to be successful. Um, tailoring will be really powerful for learners as well, I think. Being able to meet them where they are, to understand where they are, to work with them in a way that works for them will be effective. As I said, leadership needs to know about patterns and instruction. And the researchers will be out there helping us answer the questions that we're trying to answer. One of the things I'm really excited about is doing this research on our campus for our classes. Most of our education researchers on this campus spend all their time looking at something that has nothing to do with education on this campus. Sometimes that's been because they couldn't get any data about our campus. So now they can. Maybe they'll do that here. All right. So education generates this really rich stream of accessible data. Michigan is moving to help you take advantage of the research and teaching opportunities that are there. So it's not okay next year to go into your class and say, what a mystery, I don't know who these people are or what they're doing or, or how they're learning. Instead, you should identify the questions, find the right data, and share the results with everyone. And the Learning Analytics Task Force intends to help start doing that. And it's actually not starting next fall, as this slide which I took from another talk is. It's starting right now. <laughs> you caught me. All right, thank you very much. So the, the university data warehouse is what provides our portrait of the student. And so if somebody at some point left a record in that data warehouse that says you were part of one of the learning communities, then yes, we can answer those questions. Art doesn't look at them right now, but it's there in the data warehouse. Many co-curricular things are not in the data warehouse right now. So a lot of that falls in the category of improving the data that we have. Is the student affairs division involved? Not right now. Yeah. I mean, clearly there are a lot of things we might like to know. I've always wanted to do a study of how much it matters which hall you're in in the dorm. <laughs> Somebody told me that they have done a study like this somewhere. Um, you know, does it matter what who your roommate is? You know, how correlated are the GPAs of roommates? <laughs> I don't know. I, I want to know. Yeah? I have a couple of hard, <clears throat> hard questions. One, with the matching that you described, can you match on more than one variable? So we built a couple different tools, a couple different options. Um, you know, it's a front end kind of, so underneath you could add more and more different ways of doing it. Um, in keeping with the art style of having pull down menus so that people don't have to know in detail what's going on, they don't have to write the SQL or anything, uh, what you would do is design things you want to do and then write that tool underneath and add it to the list. So, so in principle, you could do anything that's possible. And my other question is, how do you gain access to it? Is that it's currently? Right. So I think if you want access to art, what college is it? Um, education. Okay. Um, <laughs> right to Phil Deloria. I don't know who else. Does anyone know who else would provide access? I think I think Phil yeah. well, there's will know who. Rob Wilson. There are a couple of like, task force, force members that are in my department. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Phil yeah. Busberry. Sure. We'll find it. I mean, I, you know, I, the plan has been for quite a while to make it open to every faculty. And I just don't know why it, that hasn't quite happened. 
they are giving it out willy-nilly to every new faculty member and stuff, so I don't think there's any real big restriction on it. I think they just haven't quite, I'm not sure why. Just to understand what you just said, they then it's written in the language so that a programmer, we all have the right to be able to go in and, and muck with the code and make No, I mean, you know, we're trying to support something here. You let people go rewrite the innards of the lecture tool. <laughs> 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 Yeah, All right, anyway, so I don't know how this is going to be supported. We, we got support from Alice in the IT committee to hire a person who just is finishing doing this one-year project. He's got a nice new job. He's going off to it. You know, the reason I hired this guy is because he has a data graphic on his blog. Anyway, he's, he's, he's done with us. So we're handing it over to Alice in A, and what we're hoping is that we can build something around it so that these kind of tools can be advanced. Our purpose was to build one. The other thing that I would add to just to provide some framework to it. So Rob Wilkie reports up in to the shared world between Emerald and I who have the quality advising world. And so I actually have a staff person that specializes in data and we see some of these reports. And so when Ezra and I, in terms of advising for LSNA and want to access stuff, we'll typically try and put on the, the list and we have have some staff people yeah, that right. package on that would be able to do queries. And I have had people from other colleges just say, as one-offs, can we find out something about this class or particularly in our case, I think the population. But sometimes I would say in general. So I think somewhere between Ezra and Silvaloria, you know, we can figure out and we maybe have some bandwidth for staff because if you always like saying what people want to ask. And, and it, you know, so might be the right answer is you should come to this task force and we should work. Right. I mean, that's yeah, what we're, we're here for. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to clarify, because I hear mm -hmm. in some text that these two mm -hmm. questions so far, that you don't have to propose to use art to your very No, not at all. Right? Art is no. just an example of a very analytics tool. And in fact, IPS has a uh, part of the staff member that is dedicated to helping the task force make connections to the data warehouse. So come with ideas, and we'll help you figure out how they happen. That was the technical support part of yep. the art. That's right. a good point. So you don't have to write to SQL. Potentially, you can write the proposal for what needs to happen in the SQL, and then the ITS staff person can can do that. Have the question. Work don't the worry about the details. Yeah, you would start with the question. That's really what, what yeah. you need the most. And you know, part of what your question was about, Connie, is there in, inside the data warehouse. The data is complicated. It's a live data set that's growing all the time. It's very arcane. So if I want to, for instance, to find out who's in the honors program. The way that is flagged in the data has changed with time. And you would have to know that, right? So you shouldn't have to know that because it won't work. So instead, we're thinking about how you can make clean data releases or something so that there's a version that you can take things at face value. Yeah. So um, C-Tools is a whole independent, rich set of data from, the, uh, from what you find at the data warehouse. So what's how does one go about, can one go about getting access to data? Is there talk of some kind of art like front end <laughs> SQL so that I can know, for example, who downloaded my practice exam? I know, this is one of the great questions. You know, what, when did they do it? Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, how many, just all these kinds of things. You know, at, at a level of granularity, um, you know, that, that kind of is appropriate for understanding real, you know, day-to-day -day student behavior. Exactly, I mean, I think that's what it's, what it's powerful for. So Dan Kiskis over here so from ITS, <laughs> He's been so loading all, all of the data that <coughs> UseLab, I guess, maintained for all these years. Right. Into the, so it actually is moving into the data warehouse. Yeah, okay. Correct. All, all the, um, the session data, when students get on, log on and off, and all the event data, so everything they do of significance in the system is already in the data warehouse. Um, I created and actually, I gave a presentation uh, yeah, in SLAM last year on a prototype in business objects, which is a tool we use for reporting of exactly the kind of type of questions you're asking. Um, and so I have that available, which um, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to, con if you contact me, I'm willing to maybe have reports come to you. Uh, I'm going to be working on, a, I'm trying to put together a project to actually make that so that it's, you can have it as like a link in C tools where you can just go to and see your Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, let's you can talk about that offline. <coughs> But I would add to that, though, um, as the, the use lab has been analyzing the CTOS data for years, and if you want some advice about 
which events mean what and what mm -hmm. the system captures or doesn't capture and the way it captures it. So now the beauty of the ITS system is you don't need us to get it out, in, but we might be able to advise you on figuring out what, what's in there that you want based on right. what the questions are that you want to ask and we're happy to work with faculty. Yeah, the, the, the caveat for the reports that I put up and I presented was it's most of the stuff that like came out of my head. Like, I'd be interested in knowing this if I were teaching a class, but I don't know if it's what you want. So that's where yeah. we need to have yeah. that conversation of what really is useful to you and can help you do what you want to do. You know, because you may be trying to change you know, how you teach or how you put information on C tools or the timing of when you do something or when you want uh, uh, GSI to be available for advising. I mean, there's all kinds of things you may be trying to do and those are different questions that require different data. So, you know, it's those kind of things we want to make it a little more interactive or a little more yeah. able to be able to answer the report. Yeah. Question? <coughs> Is there, a, is there documentation available about what the data structure of the data warehouse is? There is, actually. So ITS maintains a really nice data dictionary. Okay. It looks a little arcane if you've never looked at data dictionaries before, <laughs> but it's all, the information is actually all there okay. that you can find out. You, you can't run a database without doing that, I think. But th it's on an open public web as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've changed subject a little bit about eCoach. Could you tell just Give us a little bit more insight into eCoach and I where talk it stands. All I, afternoon, by the way. Yes. Uh, when so will it go outside the physics realm, if at all, or do right. you plan for that? Or? Yes. Um, so we built it in the physics realm because that's my playground, right? So, but you know, when I learned about so the, the history here is that I learned about the fact that public health was doing this from a guy Vic Strecker who does this work. And it, it just seemed like such a great opportunity. So we found a way to get some support for it. We got a grant from the Next Generation Learning Challenge, a Gates Foundation thing, to try it in physics. And that grant was really a one-year grant. We stretched it to a year and a half. We ran it in January, the, the winter term. We were able to show that it has a nice impact on people. We're running it again right now in physics. I am more than ready to take that to First, probably the other large science courses, and we actually wrote a proposal to do that, which was turned down. Um, I supported that proposal. I know you did. You wrote a nice letter for us. So. Um, um, anyway, we're going to find a way to do that. I'm pretty sure. So I would think that during the next year we'll start expanding. Brenda Gunderson was here; she had to leave, but um, we're also talking about doing with statistics. It's a great target class for this, um, and we've learned a lot about how to do this how important it is to get students to engage with the system, different ways to um, provide the advice, stuff like that. So I think we're really ready to do it. Can I ask you a question though? If you are, uh, but it's really for you, Tim. For people who are interested in potential users of that, um, would it be advisable for them to work first on the getting together the information that the system uses to, to right. Because, I mean, you have 10 years worth of data, right? right? And you generated that because you're Tim and you know what you're doing. Other people might have to have that kind of startup time before they could use the yeah. system to understand what those messages need to say, what behaviors are captured in the system that generates the messages. Mm -hmm. and so so I should, I should uh, say we're writing a paper called How to E-Coach. There you go. Uh, which is mostly done, and it just describes what we did. Mm -hmm. So it's maybe not the best way to do it, but it's what we did. It turns out, I think, that the analysis of historical data is, is useful. It might contain important things. But um, the richest part of our project was gathering advice from people. Mm -hmm. So what should we say to a student who's there in front of us? And we gathered that advice from a bunch of faculty members. We used all the Science Learning Center study group leaders to give us advice. What would they say to a student who is struggling in this class? And they're in there teaching it right now. They're doing that. Um, and one of the nicest features of the system is that it lets you present the advice in the voice of a person like that Science Learning Center study group leader. So let's say you're a, a terrified pre-med who's really worried it's going to ruin their chance of going to medical school. So we give you advice, probably the same advice I would give, but it comes from a person who says, I was a terrified pre-med and I was afraid this was going to, but I learned that if I did this and this and this, I could be successful in this class, <coughs> right? That kind of, um, that kind of testimonial the public health people know that's very powerful. So you could start gathering this kind of stuff, and I think it, it would be a good idea to start thinking about it. So my question attaches to the e-coach, and that is, do you, did you have findings based on the first iteration mm -hmm. 
that it made a difference. Yes, we did. And then y you could then use it to encourage students' use Absolutely. of the eco-ocean right. economy. So well, I, I just this visited all the intro classes this last week. Iterative. I told them that students who engaged with eCoach last term did about a quarter letter grade better than the people who didn't. And that was accounting for their incoming status, for their incoming GPA, and their, uh, their standardized test scores. So we basically predict what grade they should have. We see what grade they actually got. We find the people who are engaged in the system did better. I mean, it's, it's not a miracle work. It's not like get A plus overnight, but it helps. It gives them a few pieces of advice that they take, and then they're like, oh, I study a little better, you do a little better, or whatever. We're working to publish that, too. Um, how much information has the university gathered on where students go afterwards? I'm asking this as mm. somebody who's coming from the major who just got listed as the worst major. For <laughs> <laughs> and, and congratulations. Yeah. 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 congratulations. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <believe it, but laughs> No. Um, that's an interesting question. That, that's a good example of something that hasn't been in this registrar realm, right? So data like that, as far as I know, gets collected occasionally, usually around reaccreditation time. So if you look back at what they did for the last one in 2010, was it 2010? Yeah, a, yeah, a couple of years ago, they did gather some pretty nice data. It's not completely comprehensive. They can never find everybody. But it's pretty good, and it's a very <coughs> earnest effort to understand what's going on. Um, you know what, this, this kind of stuff is evolving. It may be much easier in the future to know where people really are going. You know? But right now, that's, that's as far as I know the status of things. Development is another source. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but they don't share their data with us very freely. That's been my <laughs> <laughs> But there's a new, it, they just launched a new database of stuff, yeah. which may make it easier than when Yeah, it I don't think the easier. problem is technical. <laughs> yeah, and so there's actually some information though for students who go on to med school and things yeah, like that's that. True. Professional that school. Yeah, that Noonan has access to. So you can see for students who are anthropology majors and pre med, you know, how successful were they? Did it actually hurt them to be an anthro major or whatever have you? So that's a little slice. That's, I think, a great example of a study we should do. So I, I know a lot of people don't love pre-med majors, right, or pre people who are pre-med students. <coughs> so I think they're wrong to not love them. They're great students. But there are a huge number of them here. We have 750 people a year take the, take the MCAT exam, go to medical school. I mean, it's huge. So it would be a really nice study to find out how they're doing, what kinds of preparation really leads to success for that goal. I mean, it's a good goal to be a doctor or something along with that. So, so you had a question. Yeah, um, so some of the learning activities actually Yeah, most of them probably. <laughs> yeah. So the instructor asks the student to modify Google Docs right? mm -hmm. and uh, Piazza. So how do you measure, what's your uh, suggestion to measure the learning happening over there? And with this, is this like, do you recommend the uh, instructor if they want to use learning and like it's better, better to use the university system instead of go outside for <laughs> to use other systems? I think that's just like a classic outside. research um, strategy question, right? There are some things that are on the table and easy to use. So of course you want to think about using those. And there are opportunities that are harder to get to, but in fact, partly because they're harder to get to, nobody else is doing them and it's a great opportunity to do a new thing, right? So I, I think one of my goals with this task force was to make sure that we at least use the university's data really well, because there it is, it's pretty easy to use. But I'm really excited about using these new things. I just think that it's gonna require a higher level of expertise on the people who do it. So, um, Piazza, online homework systems, all these things, they require somebody to figure out how we would get data from it, what would that data be like, how would we integrate it with what we have in the university system. I mean, it's just a harder task. It's not, I mean, it could be great, but it's a little harder. So, can I yeah. add to that? So one of the things that is beneficial about the Learning Analytics Task Force is that since we have the provost support in a year, uh, so we might, University of Michigan might in the future, every time it negotiates a contract with a LMS, to say that one of the things we want is learning analytics. We want, we want the data. Right, yeah, we want all the data. And so that's, for example, one of the things that is happening, and there are discussions with Coursera about what the data might get. But already we, I mean, in the, in the contract with Google, when you say mm -hmm. data that we own, in legal, in legal terms, Michigan owns the data for what happens in Google that's right. for us. However, we're in conversations with them, that we being some of USLAB and ITS, 
because it turns out, oh, well, that might be true, but they may be limiting the number of queries we could do or how much data we can pull and at what level we can pull it. So I think in part when we're still learning about how to make that relationship work, but in theory, we should be able to access all of those events that happen at least at Google and Coursera, as I understand it, at the level of the individual student record. But yeah, the for now it's not going right. to be as easy <laughs> as getting it out of the tools mm -hmm. or the registrar's office or so far. Some yeah. online homework systems provide a fairly rich stream of analytics already. The math and physics system that we, we yeah. use will tell you at the student level, even at the problem level, how much time they're spending on yeah. different, different tasks. Piazza will tell you how many posts each student has viewed, how many each student has contributed to. Um, it's great because you can get at the, the plotting level all the right. Data. Yeah. yeah. So you can integrate it. And my experience has been some of these companies are really mm -hmm. open to it. They're actually pretty game to do research on these topics. They don't have the bandwidth to do it all the time. And others, you know, have leadership that is like, data is money. <laughs> you can't have my data, right? Well, some of them are telling you that they probably they, they don't know what they're doing. Of course, there is an example. When when we signed the Coursera contract, you know, I don't think Coursera had thought about what, you know, they were computer scientists. They were gathering the data, but they weren't thinking that much about where they were. Well, there's a difference between, between the data, there's a difference between being able to get to their interface to view the data yeah. and being able to integrate that data into it yeah. and link it to other data that we have and to be able to use that in some other you know, visualization or you know, yeah. element. Hmm. Other questions? If not, then thank you very much. Take